Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Participants at the podium, we respect each person and an empty. Like I say, my name is Vivian, and I am a grateful alcoholic today. <laughs> and this is our panel, Women in AA. You know, I feel a kinship with women in AA. You know, we come in, and we want to be doubly good. I know I did. I'm speaking for Vivian, you know. I want to try that much harder, you know. I heard a man say, uh, the only thing worse than a uh, drunken man is a drunken woman. I didn't agree with it, but that's what he said. <laughs> so I said, and that was in Kentucky at a conference in 74. But I said, I, we have tried, I mean, we try extra hard, you know, extra hard. Because it seems like we have to get that self-respect, that self-esteem, you know. Like my mother said, uh, a man take a bath and he missed the so-and-so. You know, he get all dressed up. And women, after they get drunk or something, they still, you know what, you know. So it was a double standard there. But women in AA, have, and uh, being a woman in AA, has brought me great pride and great joy and a whole lot of self-respect. Vivian found Vivian in AA, and Vivian got her self-respect back in AA. There's no other place, as I know, that could bring all that back to me. There's no other uh, organization that I could go to, that where I could look myself in the mirror and say, Hey, you're a pretty good girl. I love you today. Because when I came to AA, I hated myself. I thought there was nothing lower than me. But thanks to you people and the love you shared with me and the understanding, I'm, I'm a different person. I feel different. Like the man said last night, when I went to my first meeting, I felt comfortable. And I felt I belonged. I have three lovely women here on the panel. And I love about them because when I asked them, no one said no. They didn't hesitate. They said yes, and then they said, why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what AA teaches you. You say yes first and think about it later. <laughs> that's, not, that's it. <laughs> think about it later. Say yes first. Make sure you say yes. Do not refuse because you will have the worst guilt trip you ever had in your life. <laughs> I have done that. I have done that. I said no, and I said, oh, God, why did I say that? I said, please, little man, one more time, and I'm going to say yes, because I will do anything to keep what I have in this fellowship. That's how much it means to me today. So my first panel is help me welcome is Zoe S. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Zoe Shaver, and I am a happy, grateful, recovering alcoholic. Hi, Zoe. I see a lot of familiar faces here, and I'm very pleased to see old friends again. This is AA for Women, and I think it is the most fantastic thing that has happened for women in this decade, in the last 50 years. I think about my grandmother who did not have this opportunity. This program was not available to her. Women in AA, we carry a torch like in the Olympics. One gives it to the other. Someone gave it to me. I can't say no to AA because someone took the time for me. Time to show me that there was self-worth, self-esteem, some type of quality. Being that my birthday is the 15th of January, the same as Martin Luther King, I decided to adopt his slogan, I have a dream. I have a dream that all the women that are alcoholic can get into recovery, that they can establish their lives and use the talents and capabilities that they hadn't even known that they had. I want to come up to the mountain and I want to see lots and lots of recovering families, lots of women who are doing careers, whether it be domestic maintenance engineering, which is homemaking, or that it be anything that they would like to do. I don't know what I was like before I got into the program. I think I was searching for me. I was searching to be my own person. It was like uh, playing hard to get when you're a teenager and you're dating and you want to date somebody and someone would say to me, well, they always just play hard to get. I thought, if I play hard to get, they won't know that I want to date this person. You know, so I just didn't know how to do that. When I wanted something, I wanted it, and I went after it. And when I got into AA, it was just exactly that. Nobody else could understand me. And they gave me a, lump, a love and a warmth that I'll never forget. It's a feeling that's never left me. 
it was a place to go where people recovered, and not recovered in the past sense, but began in the now moment, that right now, this minute, I could change my life by doing one thing, changing my attitude. Nothing could change for me in my life in any area unless I changed my attitude. How many times I had heard, oh, you better change your attitude. You got an attitude. They, okay, but to what? You know, we always hear you got to change your attitude, but to what? Nobody gives us the house. So when I got into AA, they said, well, become honest. And I thought, well, I had been honest. I looked at that a little deeper, and I said, oh. And then they said, be open-minded. And so I listened very carefully, and I started to compare, and I realized, no, that's not it, so you identify. So then came the W, the willingness. I was willing. I was ready, and I certainly was able. And I decided that with God's help, I could accomplish more than I had ever dreamed, ever. God was always there in my life. I had no problem with that. I didn't think he was mad at me. I figured that there was a curse put on me. And I think I knew who put it on there. You know, you got to have somebody to blame. And if I'm a child of God, and he's been so generous with me, then why should I be going through this kind of a crisis? So because God got so tired of hearing how misunderstood I was, he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to give you a whole group of people that are going to understand you and leave me alone for a while. Let me work on some other people's problems. <laughs> but with the persistence of prayer, and prayer I call energy, and I give my prayers permission to do what they're supposed to do. I don't tell God how to do it. And my mom told me some time ago that I used to tell her about praying for this or praying for that, but I always told God how to do it and when it should be done. So now I find that there's something that really works, and it's three little principles. One is that I love my life. The other is that I enjoy my work. I love it. And then I am also of service to people. And I find in that I am very fulfilled. I am needed, wanted, loved, and appreciated. And that's all I ever wanted. I didn't want to be a great big flower. I just wanted to be part of the little flowers that, you know, make this life a little sweeter. I wanted to be able to wipe away a tear. I wanted to be able to fix something for somebody because I was here, because I've crossed your path. One of the other blessings that I've had in my life is to be a mom, to be a friend, to be a sister, a daughter, and a wife. I've enjoyed many roles in my life, and I've only just begun. And you know, I would really wish that this whole room was just busting with women here, but I am more than pleased to see the group that is here and the men that are here too, because the men are very much affected by their wives drinking or their mothers or the female in their life, that uh, the hand that rocks the cradle should not shake. That's why the stigma is so hard on us. The thing is that we are dynamic in recovery. If people could only focus more on recovery instead of the identification, okay, you identify, but you got to splinter in your thumb, and you go to Dr. Feelgood, and he says, well, here's a pill for your fever, and one for the nausea, and he wraps up your thumb and sends you home, and you say, hey, guy, common sense goes, you take the splinter out, and then, you know, fix that up, and everything else will start to heal. Once we get the alcohol out of our system, a lot of other problems start to dissipate. What I found is that being a recovering person, I do have control over my thoughts and my feelings. I'm no longer conditioned to old programming. And from time to time, I find that, you know, pops up like a weed in my garden, and I have to pluck it out, and hopefully I get to the roots. Because I'm not perfect. In the last one that was perfect, they crucified him. And so, therefore, I decided, as the program uh, suggests, to make progress. I'm as perfect as I can be today for this now moment. Tomorrow I will be better than I am today. But I'm making progress, and that's what's important. In the big book, in the promises, that's what they talk about. Spiritual progress. I can't do anything without God's help. I choose not to do anything without his help because it goes a lot better. It goes a lot smoother. I trust him. I just do. I just know. The evidence has been so overwhelming. That why should I ever deny that God helps me, that he listens to my prayers? I have a daily word I read every morning, and today I talked about freedom, and I said, that's what I have. I have not only freedom, I have liberty. I can come here, and I can choose to talk to these wonderful people that are here. When I leave, I am just 
surrounded with such great vibe, being a part of a movement that says, I can and I will and I am, not that I'll try. Even my clients, I don't like to hear I'll try. I say, I'm not buying that. Tell me I can. Let's start in I believe that I can just for this day. All I've got is one day. Nothing's been guaranteed to me that I'm going to have tomorrow and the next 127 years. I just have today. I can plan a little bit for tomorrow. My budget would like me to plan a little bit for tomorrow instead of using everything for today. But, you know, patience and tolerance with myself and other people. This is what I found so beneficial, that everything does happen for a reason, and I learn lessons, and, and I'm somewhere at the right place at the right time all the time. I even got a great parking spot today. I said, okay, guys. I said, you know, let's do our thing. I want a parking spot that's not, you know, three flights up and... You know, 95 cars down the opposite end. And sure enough, I look and, okay, right on the first level there, I found a space for me. I said, thank you. I always say thank you. I think friends like to hear thank you. And God is my friend. He is my guardian, my guide. I get these intuitive thoughts, these little hunches, and I play those hunches that say, just do your best today, Doey. Do your best today. How would you like to be treated today, Doey? And I think, okay, that's how I have to treat other people, the way I would like to be treated, with lovingness, with kindness, with appreciation, with words that are appropriate for a woman's mouth, not to sound like a a truck driver or somebody down on the dock. That's not complimentary to a woman any more than her drinking is. And so I found that with the inventory, looking at my life a day at a time, that I, I am the wealthiest woman in the world. Because I have things money can't buy. A king would give his ransom and then some for the things that I have. And that friendship, women friendship, which I did not have before I came to AA. I don't know why we are the way we are with about women kind of hung up about, you know, can I trust this woman and will she uh, be a true friend and will she be honest or is she going to make uh, a play from my boyfriend or my husband or something like that. And I found that these were old conditioned habits that I was telling you about before that we come to uh, experience as we're growing up and maybe if you're having a mother-daughter competition sort of thing that, you know, Mom, I'll show you how terrific and wonderful I am and you're competing with your mother, you might find that that also contributes to a mistrust with women. I don't compete with women. I share with them. I share with humanity. I share with anybody that comes across my path because I always benefit yeah, it's a selfish program, and, and humbly I say whatever I give out is because genuinely that's part of my heart. I just like giving and doing and being for you because as I do well for you, I do well for myself. And it's like I store up dividends in a, in a Swiss bank account, and every once in a while those dividends come back just at the moment that I need them. I had a pursuit um, a couple months ago project that I had to engage in that I chose to, and I used the principles of AA, I used the principles of success through positive mental attitude, and they work because I was persistent and I was consistent, and my gut level kept saying, it's going to happen, this particular uh, project will come to a peaceful and beautiful conclusion, and it was a matter of a purchase of some property, and to the last hour, the last day, It did work out because I never gave up. The same thing with recovery. Don't give up. All these principles that we learn in this program are so valuable in our everyday lives. That's what makes us winners. We were never losers to begin with. We were never born losers. We always were winners. Those of you that are here today, you have known how it is to survive. Families know how it is to survive. But when there's that change of attitude, meaning that you're going to work in harmony with your God, you're going to work in harmony with the laws of man and nature, that you're not going to be the sum total of your choices, uh, which might have been to drink. You know, I'm the sum total of my choices today. That means that I choose to be sober. When somebody says, well, you can't drink, yes, I can. I just choose not to because I cannot guarantee my actions after the first drink. And you know, that really is a wonderful, wonderful feeling that today I am free from beverage alcohol owning my life. I don't have any regrets or remorses and so forth like that. 
it's a nice feeling to know what I did last night and what I've done this morning, that I don't have to chase around looking for where did I hide that bottle so I remember first thing and I spend three quarters of a day trying to find it and don't. And then at some obvious place of family finds me and go, oh, my God. You know, talk about the insanity. I like being responsible today. I like being dependable. This is part of my design as a human being for being on Earth, that I have a job to do. And my particular job, not only to be sober, but to share that sobriety with the beautiful gift that's been given to me. It's priceless, and nobody can take it from me but me. I wish you all the most glorious conference. I think that it is dynamic and fantastic that we have it in this gorgeous building. I was sitting here thinking, the women that are in their homes or wherever they are drinking today, you know how boring that is, you know? And here we are with wonderful people in a beautiful place like this. This is exciting, and you can go shopping, too, you know? So there's, you know, a multitude of benefits in being sober. Walking with your head up high and tall, and you put your feet one in front of the other very solidly. And those of you who have had the experiences that we as the panel and myself has had, sometimes you don't walk too well, <laughs> and you stumble, and you know. I decided that this bottle that beat me black and blue, you know, bumping into walls and furniture and so forth, it's going to pay. It was going to pay. It made me dance to its tune, and now it was going to pay. By that I mean I have turned my will and my life over to the care of God, and I said because of my gratitude, being my attitude, I will share with any woman, any person who would like what we have here. And you earn it. You earn it the hard way. I've been a very lucky girl in many, many ways, but this is something I really had to work for, and I'm glad because then it's really mine. It's not plastic. I found honest people, trustworthy people, people who smile right from their toes. And, you know, travel, I love to travel. I've been in New Orleans. I'm looking forward to going to Montreal. I hope I see you all there in 85. You know, sobriety is anything but dull, and I do not want to be normal. Normal nearly killed me. It's absolutely boring just to cope with things, just to deal with things. I, I want to address problems straight on and make a decision. Can I do something about it or can't I? Then I use that serenity prayer. Take a deep breath and... If I can't do anything right at that moment, I get busy with something. And if I get one of those human conditions, which, you know, being human, you do, you get a little down in the dumps once in a while, my immediate conditioned mind in the AA way of thinking is, okay, you're a little bit down in the dumps, you want to have a few tears, okay, two, that's all you get. And uh, do you feel better, Joey? I say, yeah, I feel better. And me, myself, and I have these conversations, and, and uh, I say, okay, let's get up and go. And then we get up and go, and we do something positive, either sew a button, wash a floor, you know, do something for somebody else, something outside of myself. I pick up any kind of literature that I know I'm going to get some kind of positive feedback from. Because depression is a luxury I cannot afford. Not only that, it makes wrinkles. And I'm going to age gracefully. I decided <laughs> that, you know. And AA is just, it's a wealth beyond measure. Pressed down, heaped up, running over, and then some. But it's not going to be that way unless I share it. And that's what I'm here today to do, to share with you my experience, my strength, and my hope for you to continue in mine too. Thank you very much for this privilege. Thank you, Joy. That was beautiful. Nothing to say behind that. My next guest speaker is Patsy G. Good morning. My name is Patsy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, And it's good to be here. I'm finally glad that this is almost over for me. <laughs> From the time Vivian asked me, my life has not been the same, you know. I've been rehearsing every day of my life, you know. I know I qualify to be here, see, because uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, my story is real simple. Uh, thank God God found me and brought me to AA, you know. And uh, all the things that happened before I got here, you told me, just tell them what it's like to be a woman in AA. And I said, a woman in AA, and I'm a little girl inside. I'm about six, <laughs> you know, but uh, I can't share today. It's important that I share. You know, God, as I understand him, has brought me a magnificent way. You know, I'm all the way up on the 38th floor. You know, can you believe that? Uh, in this 
hotel feeling good about myself today. You know, I uh, I woke up, uh, you know, NAA, two teenage sons. So there was three teenagers in the house, me and my two teenage sons, you know. And I guess that's the part I want to share with this morning, being a sobering up mother in a, a teenager with teenagers, you know. And uh, it was rough a lot of times, you know. But I thank God for AA because they told me, Patsy, you keep coming and don't drink and it'll be okay, you know, in spite of what the teenagers did. See, and they gave me every reason in the world to get drunk, you know. They didn't appreciate me. They were not trying to help me stay sober. They wouldn't come to Alateen, you know. They didn't go through all those things that I thought they were supposed to go through. Now, since Mother is no longer on the couch, passed out. See, I was on the sofa a lot, passed out, and uh, I believe that my son thought I was asleep. You know, I heard somebody talk about a fantasy. I maintain that fantasy, you know. I didn't use words like passed out and stuff like that. I was asleep, you know, and I slept real sound, and they couldn't wake me up for hours and hours, you know. But, see, that was sleep for me, you know, but... uh. This was what I was looking at when I got to AA. See, my idea was now everything is going to be great, you know. It's no longer going to be that, that, that personality change on the weekend because I was that kind of drinker that I had to go to work every day to try to provide a, a living and a shelter for me and these two sons of mine. And uh, on the weekend, I became that free spirit that I wanted to be all the time anyway. See, I didn't want to be a mother. Those responsibilities came out of nowhere, you know. I was busy partying. See, my idea was to get to be an adult and to go party as much as you wanted to. Sure have a job so you could buy clothes and pay rent and have credit cards and shit like that, good credit, stuff like that, you know. But uh, party, you know, by no means get stuck with a bunch of kids, you know. Maybe a rich husband, but never no kids and stuff like that, you know. So, uh. I got stuck with those things, and I found out I had two husbands before I got to AA, you know. I, I was trying. See, I tried a lot of things before I got here, so after getting here and being told so beautifully what to do and what not to do, I was willing. Because, see, I had tried marrying people, you know. I had tried changing up. One won't do, get another one. See, I believed, I, you know, mother told me one won't work, get another one, you know. I remember that. All those other things she told me, I didn't pay any attention. But when you found that uh, a husband or a boyfriend was not working out to your satisfaction, change him. And as I drank, I changed them often, <laughs> you know, especially when they started to criticize and complain about my drinking, you know. If they started to complain about what kind of mother I was, you know, did not take my kids to the park and picnics and stuff like that. And see, I couldn't do all those things. I was too sick. You know, I was either busy getting sick and drunk or being with my man, and the kids had to wait until all this was over with, see, so... They came up with a lot of things they didn't get a chance to do. So when I got to AA and they told me, well, Patsy, you keep coming, you stay sober, and you get a chance to do all those fun things you always wanted to do but couldn't. See, alcohol really would not let me do. Because I started drinking on Friday, and if I wanted to take the kids to the park or the zoo or the movies, uh, that alcohol told me, they doing fine. Let them watch TV, you know. Stay out the streets, you know. It'd be You being a good mother, you know. In the end of my drinking, I drank a lot at home. I hear a lot of women talk about drinking at home as opposed to drinking in the streets. I drank both, both places. It's miserable both places, see. Because I really love being in the streets. I crave that excitement that comes from sitting on them bar stools. See, I love bar stools. I mention a lot. <laughs> I got a friend that calls me Boston. Some days I don't like it, but you see, I loved them. Because I'd sit there, and that mirror was there, and those bottles were there, and I was the prettiest thing in there. My world was wonderful. There was nothing wrong, you know. Once I'd get into one of them little smoky joints and they closed the door, well, I was home free. I didn't want to go back out there and be anybody's mother or whatever I didn't want to do, I didn't have to. As long as I sat on the bar stool and the music played, and then when I'd finally drag home and pass out, and it was telling these boys, uh, go get Mama and Alka-Seltzer, please, you know. I'm so sick, I wish I was dead, you know. And I was like that a lot of times because I had no limit to what I drank. You know, I just drank till I passed out. And I couldn't tell anybody that before I got to AA. See, because I'd go into a blackout always. That was my other personality that came out. 
And when I woke up the next morning, I didn't remember anything, you know. I remember coming home from work on Friday, getting ready to go to this party, telling the kids, go to your room, watch the TV, here's your McDonald's or your Kentucky Fried, you know, and be good and lock the door, you know. And I guess they were about 11 or 12, 10 and 11. And I assume that they should have sense enough how to stay in the house by themselves while I go out at night. See, I, that, that's the kind of responsible parent that alcohol allowed me to be. And I also made a decision. You know, I knew somehow that the law said you don't leave kids in the house by themselves until they're a certain age or something like that, you know. I read a lot, so I knew a lot of little things, you know. Did I apply them? No way. So I decided to God as I understand him, you see, I had been brought up in a Baptist church, and uh, God shoved down my throat for 15 years, you know. And I knew that he did a lot of things, and most of them were ugly to me, you know. You see, he didn't give me all the things I thought I needed from the time I was a kid. I was always dissatisfied, always felt unloved. I never felt a part of anything. So I told him to the best of my ability, I'm going to go party, see, and I'm not going to church and none of those things because I'm not going to be a hypocrite like the rest of these people, you know. <laughs> they go to church on Sunday and they come home and get drunk. I'm just going to get drunk Saturday night and I'll be smelling too bad to be sitting up in church on Sunday morning. So I'm not going to bother. I don't bother you. Don't you bother me, you know. I know today that's a totally insane way for a human being to live. That's a savage state of mind to think that really he could have no part in my life if I just told him don't bother me. But anyway, I remember making this bargain with it, you know. I didn't make many, but this one was special. If I ever come home on one of these nights from my party and being with my love of whoever he was at the time, <laughs> and my kids, my apartment is burned down, or my kids are dead or something like that, I'll kill myself, you know. Just that simple. And I was as satisfied with that as you could possibly get, you know. I had decided not to. Be responsible, Pat, and get a babysitter, take them over your sister's house, do something positive. Mm -mm. Leave them in the house by themselves, but if I come home and something has happened, you kill yourself, you know. And that sounded good to me, and I thought that meant I was really one hell of a mother, you know, <laughs> willing to kill myself if something happened to my children. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the alcoholism, you know. That, that's what I suffer from, that kind of thinking. So when I got to A and they told me, uh, those old irresponsible ideas, they don't work, Patsy. You know, those things don't work. I had put the kids with my mother for five years to be irresponsible, and then she decided I need to come get them. That was not my plan either. See, it was okay to have them, but let mom raise them. You know, and then when they get grown and stuff like that, then they'll come to Detroit and we'll party together. That was another fantasy I had, you know. When my sons got to be adults, we would go to all these wonderful functions, you know. And I was going to be this beautiful middle-aged mom, you know. I was going to be really sharp, you know. And they were going to be rich. And I really had a fantasy going about that. But you see, nowhere in that fantasy did it ever say don't drink. See, nothing about my fantasy said don't drink. It says when you get so old and after you've done everything under the sun, and I mean I plan to do it all, then you go to church. <laughs> Cut all this stuff out, you know, just do it all. And, you know, because that's the way I thought people did. They lived their lives and they were young and wild and they drank and they slept around and stuff like I was doing. And then when they got too old to do those things, then they go went and tried talking to God and making some kind of pact with him. And I thought I had that same opportunity. You see, I didn't know that you don't always get that chance, you know. I knew people died young, but it wasn't going to happen to me. See, I was going to drink and be in those blackouts and do my thing, and I was a power greater than anything I knew. I'd always end up at home, and I thought I was as slick as you could get, see. You know, I'd be in blackouts, but I didn't stagger. You know, I think uh, I heard Katie talk about a fella calling her drunk, and it brought that thing back to my stomach, see, because I've been in situations when people say, oh, shut up, you're just drunk and stuff like that, you know. And that always hurt my feelings so bad, you know, especially if it was one of those fellas that I was being madly in love with and he had started to criticize how much I drank, you know. I was always hurt about that, and I was sorry that he didn't understand. See, I needed alcohol. That was the only way that I felt comfortable. You know, I was always most superior when I drank. I was better than everybody else, you know, and uh, 
I could get off in my fantasy, you know, through the alcohol. No other way was I able to do that, see, because every day when I got on the bus to go to, to my job, uh, it was a dead, dull kind of existence that they talk about. I kept me a book handy so people would think that I was just so intelligent and well read. <laughs> you know, I had all of I read everything on the bestseller list. I kept my newspaper. See, they were defenses for me because that way when I got on the bus with my paranoia, you wouldn't speak to me, talk to me, or look at me because I didn't want to be bothered. But come Friday, I talk, speak, look at you, let you in my house, but don't come before Friday. You know, that's the kind of person I was. I didn't want my kids outside playing too much because I didn't want nobody else's kids over my house. I didn't want to feed them or do anything to them, you know. I had a lot of real problems. And they talk about this is a disease of selfishness, and I got it. Selfish and self-centered, you know. Don't ever be bothered, Patsy, unless it's something you want to do. You know, if somebody died and it's Friday and they want you to come to a funeral or something, don't bother going because you know Friday's your day to get drunk, you know, and be free. And I didn't have time to go through a lot of fronts. I call them fronts. Some people just live that way, you know. They're responsible women. they doing the right things with their children, you know. And I was just... While in the country out there, you know, doing the best I could. But being in AA, as I said, has been the thing that has given me a life one day at a time. It's allowed me to feel like a woman, you know, most days. Uh, having what they call that self-respect and that self-esteem, you know. I walk so tired sometimes I can't stand it myself. You know, I just really, oh, you know, look who I am now, you know. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times I wish the, you know, the old associates could see me now, as they say. You know, that old bar I used to drink in Chicago, and uh, they thought that I was what I was, nothing. You know, I you know I fantasize some days about going back to Chicago and uh, they see how good I'm doing. You know, because I was really nothing, and it hurt me a lot to be nothing because I wanted to be something better, but I, I couldn't. It just seemed like the alcohol wouldn't let me. Sometimes I would say it was life if I would just get the right man. You know, trying to consider what I was talking, what I would talk about today, I thought the area that gives you the most problems, you know, kids and the men in your life, I've had a hard time, you know, <laughs> along with alcoholism, you know, uh, it's been up and down, up and down. I came into AA with a fella, and when they said, don't get involved for six months, you know, get sober first for six months to a year, and my sponsor was telling me about it, I don't need to be getting involved, see, because... I had all those old ideas, and when I got to an AA meeting, I remember a Sunday morning, and all the men were looking so good, <laughs> and hey, I was going to trade that one I had, because he had mentioned something about my drinking a couple of times, and I thought, well, all these new fresh men, and they all look good, you know, all sober and clean and smelling good, well, I was going to trade that I had and get me a new one. You know, and I had so many to choose from, you know. I could just see myself going right around the table, you know, and I know you can do that. <laughs> I thank God for my sponsor and the people that ain't told me, no, baby, that's, that's not the way it goes. <laughs> you know, that's not what A is. You know, uh, my, my sponsor called A is not a dating club, you know. <laughs> So I discarded that idea. I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll play by the rules. Because, you see, I didn't want to be drunk again. I might have been confused when I got here. I might have been as crazy as I could be when I got here. But I know I didn't want to be drunk again. I wanted to be sober. Because when I got here and they t you told me how you felt, I knew that I was at home for the first time in my life. I was comfortable. I didn't want to go back out there. So I hung on to the boyfriend and let the AA fellows alone. For the most part. <laughs> I thank God for that. I didn't bother them. See, my sponsor tells me it's not so much about them bothering me. I bother them. See, because that's my style. You know, grab one, he won't work, throw him back, get another one. And uh, she was, you know, tell me that since this is the men AA is a mental outpatient clinic, that's not a nice thing to be doing. You know, that's, they're your brothers and you love them and all those things. So, I was able to hold on to the boyfriend that I had when I got here and get sober, you know, get good and dry it out, you know, because that's what I was doing, just dry it out, you know, with no sobriety in it, but the main thing is I wasn't drinking and I wasn't passing out and I wasn't getting in a lot of trouble and I was no longer sleeping around, so I felt, hey, real important and real great, you know, my self-esteem and all those values and stuff I'd always wanted, I thought I had them, you know. 
but I kept coming. So as I started, my teenager started one in particular that I love. He started having his real problem with my newfound sobriety and my new AA baby. See, because I wasn't listening all the way. <laughs> you told me it was all about me, and uh, you stay sober day the time, your life gets better, and all those kind of things. But somehow, when I came into AA, I wanted to marry this man. And I've had schemes, designs, and manipulations all my life, so one of them was somehow I'll get sober and we'll get married. After being sober in AA, I still hadn't got a proposal, so I got pregnant. I don't know if I meant to or not, you know, but it happened. And uh, still no marriage and no proposal. You know, and you told me, keep coming, don't drink. You know, AA is big enough to absorb babies with daddies, without daddies, you know, married, unmarried. It doesn't make any difference, you know. In fact, AA is not the church, you know, uh, people that are here. Women that are here and men have done some of all, all the things that human beings can do. And we cannot afford one ever to look down on the other. So I was able to come here pregnant and hold my head up, drink plenty of coffee, you know. <laughs> Got a little caffeine kid running around. <laughs> He's four years old. But see, he didn't have to have alcohol put on him. I drank on the other two. They're doing the best they can, you know. But uh, I fed a plenty of Christian brothers. And I thought it was okay I drink one for me and one for the baby. I don't know if I ever heard that pregnant women shouldn't drink or shouldn't smoke because if you're living to party and to sit on the bar stools and do those kind of things, well, being pregnant, you're not going to let yourself be inconvenienced all the way. See, it's bad enough to be pregnant in them fat dresses and I couldn't wear my hot pants and all that kind of stuff that I love to wear. And then couldn't drink either. See, that didn't cross my mind. So with this program, God is our understanding and all the people, you know, the people that went into telling me what to do and what not to do, you know, they gave me suggestions. I got a sponsor that, uh, her name is Ida May, I'll mention her, <laughs> that outright would tell me what to do and what not to do, you know. And she'd ask me interesting questions like, you know, you are you crazy, you know, <laughs> do you realize that you are an alcoholic? And I would be thinking, well, what does that have to do with anything? You know, I graduated from high school, one year of college, you know. Well, why is she talking to me like this, as if I'm some kind of dummy, you know? And I was. <laughs> because I thought somehow I could stay sober and kind of do it my way. You know, I know today I still can't do it my way. But it's getting better because I had to learn here how to grow up and really be a woman or act like one. You know, I'd walk around sometimes uh, getting sober and I'd keep a frown on my face because my teenagers grew big and wide and bigger than me, see. So it was no longer that idea that maybe I could beat them up or something like that. So. I had decided to try to look stern around the house, you know, so they wouldn't know <laughs> that inside we was all on the same level, you know. My uh, oldest son came home on leave back in the spring, and I'm sitting there in my mother role, you know, I heard doing talk about roles, I play many of them even today, you know, because I don't really know how to be these things, so I had on my, my mother's type role, and I was cooking or doing something. And he was getting ready to go out. Now, he's 19 years old. He's home on leave. He's getting ready to go out with his friends. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm feeling like I'm being left out. You know, now, that was just this year. And I asked myself, now, you've been sober now eight, five years. You know that you're 37 years old. So why are you sitting here feeling like he's leaving you because he's not taking you out to the party with him, you know? But I really felt left out, you know? That's the little girl in me. That's the teenage part of me that has not grown up. But you told me, keep coming, it doesn't matter if you 38 on the outside and 5 or 6 on the inside, that a A can take care of that too. If you keep coming and you keep listening and you keep trying to do the things that suggested that you do, you know, make plenty of meetings. And they told me also when I got here, like I said, about staying out of affairs. <laughs> and when I first started getting sober, all the new women that came in, boy, I was just really, oh, if they asked me to be their sponsor, they got really informed, real good, not to get involved with any of these fellas in AA, and I would just really preach, you know. Today, as I look at it, and I understand a little bit better today, uh, and it seems like the name of the game is to get involved once you get here, I have accepted the fact, you know, that if that's the way they got to go, just keep coming to the meetings, don't drink. You know, it really doesn't matter who you're getting involved with. Because like my sponsor always tells me, sooner or later it's going to pan out anyway. Don't think that you come in the fog and 
as they say, fall mad in love and live happily ever after, you first have to get sober, you know. So I, I've had my chance of being able to stay here and stay sober without getting involved a lot, a little, not a lot, you know. I had to try it out, you know. There was no way you going to tell me not to, and I'm going to not do these things. You know, I had to try it out. It didn't work. Didn't work. Just like always, I picked the kind that was just like me, and we couldn't get along. Sick like me. See, I want this well fella, you know, that's good and sober and got his act together. I don't want an emotional wreck like me, you know, <laughs> sensitive and temper. I don't want something like that. I want something better. But each time I think I see one and it looks like he might work, and I grab him, see, because I'm that aggressive type. I grab him. And uh turns out not to be the same thing, you know. So I, it was suggested to me that I back off again. You know, that uh, being sober six years and being single does not mean that you have to have a, a wonderful fellow on your arm because that's not what sobriety is about. That after being married and having three kids and uh, gobs of boyfriends, <laughs> If you never get another one again a day at a time, you you way ahead of some women, you know. <laughs> that comes That comes from my spouse. You know, I don't like that, see, because I still got this fantasy about Prince Charming. And where is he? And what's taking him so long? You know? Because I mean sober is about being in love and all those kind of things and and I know that I don't really want to get married yet. See, I, I want to date like all other teenagers do and have a nice fella. I don't want all that coming on cooking and all that kind of, mm-mm, honey. No, I'm still working. Both of my sons now have grown and gone, really. Both of them in the Army, one's in the Reserve, one's in the regular Army. So it's me and my four-year-old. So, you know, mostly in my house, it's about doing what I want to do. We stop at McDonald's. He loves McDonald's, you know. So I, I don't have anybody around right in my home telling me what to do, as I call it. And I'm not ready to share yet, say. It, it takes a grown-up person, I suppose, to be an adult and be willing to go 50-50 in a relationship. I don't have that yet. You know, I just want to have my way. And you do things my way. Let me boss you. See, because I want to boss. I want to run the show. And uh, they tell me that most real men, they don't need no woman around trying to punch their buttons and tell them what to do. So, you know, I'm still single and sober a day at a time, but it's a great way to be. Because out of all the other affairs, boyfriends, and husbands, I was a miserable creature. And I'm happy today for me, you know. It's been a long way to come, and I know that it's a lot longer away for me to go. But I can get there with God in AA, as I understand it. And if I don't drink, you know. And I keep making my meetings. And thanks a lot for letting me share. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Fantastic. My last panelist is here. <laughs> Miss Janet C. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Janet, and I'm a cross-addicted alcoholic. How's that, Janet? Tell back to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was thinking about women in AA when I first saw it, which was the day before yesterday. And uh, naturally, I came up with this very ideal thing, because that's part of my problem. Janet the idealist. Janet the perfectionist. And I like the notion that we should all come through these little barriers that we put up for ourselves and come to humanity. And I see in the world that we separate ourselves a great deal. He's black, he's white, he's up, he's down, she's a woman, he's a man. He's a Republican, a Democrat. They live on the east side, they live on the west side. She's fat, she's skinny, whatever. And I don't like that. I want it to be ideal. Um, some time ago, when I first came to AA, not that long, really, Janet the Idealist didn't like that notion of women in AA being singled out separated, or recognize they have any special problems. That was part of my problem, too. I understand that now, that I have never been able to accept and to cope with reality. The reality of it is that a woman is a very special kind of creature. Um, I didn't really know how to go about being one. I thought that uh, it was most important for me to be Janet before I was black, before I was a woman, before I was whatever, you know. 
But being a confused person, I had that all mixed up. So during my Janet deal, I had a lot of defiance and a lot of um, animosity and resentment in it. I resented men, and at the same time, I liked them. Uh, I consider myself a two-fisted macho lady drinker, you know. I don't know how you do that. You got to keep all these balls in the air at the same time, you know. Uh, I like one by one. And I'm discovering since I've been in AA that all this kind of hate, resentment, and fear is way down inside Janet. That's who I'm scared of. I, um... Uh, Heard somebody mention today about walking straight and never stumbling. I had a pretty prideful act, too. And all those books and all those philosophies and all those <laughs> things. So I knew a whole lot of trivia and a whole lot of things about a whole lot of things. But I didn't know how to put them together and how to live. I discovered since I've been here that if you really know something, then you do it. And when you do it, you can say that there is a correct order in your life for living, you know. So uh, from my ideal situation about women and men and humanity... Back to reality. I discovered after I got here that getting sober was just jacks or better, as I call it. Just enough to get you in the game. Doesn't mean you got a good hand. Doesn't mean you know how to play. And doesn't mean you're going to win. It just means that you finally can get in the game, you know. So after about a year, standing around being sober, you know, so what do you do for an encore? What's next? You know? And I, ha I still have a lot of these funny things going on inside of me about people and about humanity, about men and about women. But I recognize that uh, through AA, part of the reality of my experience in life is that I am a woman. And I'm finding out how to be that thing, you know. Um, some of these acts, I wear a lot of hats, do a lot of quick changes, I call myself <laughs> Janet Houdini sometimes. <laughs> now you see it, now you don't, you know. But um, I'm finding that I have to Accept myself at a very basic gut level, you guys said, get honest. That made me kind of mad, because I always figured that I was pretty honest with myself. I know now that I was honest as I knew how to be, which wasn't all that good. You know, I had a lot of masks and a lot of what I thought of as pride. You know, now that it was false pride, it wasn't a genuine article. I'm learning how to have some sincere pride as I overcome these little things in my life, as I identify them, as I learn what they are from all you other people who I call my darling mirrors, you know. I'm willing for you to share the planet with me, you know. And that's not just the women. That's the women, the men, the ups, the downs, the whatever, you know. Um, I had a lot of split kind of dichotomies going on with me about drugs, alcohol, intelligent, not intelligent, super intelligent. I'm finding now that I don't have to be better than you. I don't even have to be better than me. I can just be me, you know. And uh, it's such a comfort to finally get into the flow of things. Now, about this higher power that you people introduced me to, I always thought I knew about God. I sort of OD'd on Catholicism <laughs> early, you know. Mass every day and mass every afternoon and singing funerals on Saturday, the whole shot. But I found that uh, I can't approach this spirituality the way I was doing it. I thought that you went through your mind. It's like trying to make a telephone call on a banana. You got the wrong instrument. <laughs> you have to approach God spiritually through your spirit. And that was a very closed operation with me. Coming to you guys, you showed me how to open it up and finally get in touch with God. Actually, I didn't get anything going until I asked God. Say, hey, you see what's happening with me. Give me something. Show me something, you know. So I thought he'd show me a couple of things and I'd move on into my life. He showed me an X-rated movie, you know. <laughs> And uh, every time I think I'm handling one little part, I see something deeper and darker. But it's not scary. It's not fearsome. I'm finding that that's the real adventure in life. And it's a measure of God's love for us that he allows us to participate in our own refinement. You know, we take this lump of coal and refine it into the beautiful jewel that we can be. And God lets us do our part. Uh... I got that mixed up, too, when I first came here. You guys said, ask God. So I kind of asked God and took a seat to wait, you know. I figured he could handle everything. He's got all the power. But I see now that the beauty of it is that the process is ongoing. This never ends. And that's what the whole thing is about, the true adventure of life. I used to want action. Where is it at? What's happening? Who's got it? When does it start, you know? And uh, 
I was always dissatisfied. It was though I was looking at light through this kind of plate glass window. I could even see myself sitting over there, you know. Never really a part of things. And having to do this magnificent act all the time. So naturally, I had to shoot a lot of dope and drink a lot of booze to keep all these parts going. So that's when I was being uh, Dr. Janet, you know. <laughs> I never copped out to being a, a dope fiend like some of those others, you know. <laughs> I was a user, kind of on a plane with Edgar Allan Poe or somebody like that, you know. <laughs> and we need these things to cope with the rest of you guys, you know. That's what makes it like that, you know. But God has given me what I need through you people. And uh, like I say, the beauty of it is that it's ongoing because I can't always understand what it is right when it's presented to me. I see things a lot better in retrospect. Sometimes the whole deal has gone down. I see what happened, and it starts to come to me. I'm learning that, um, for me anyway, is to extract whatever lessons I can out of life. I don't deal with anything that's not useful to me, but not in a using sort of way. I think that the utility of life it's part of being functional. You find where you are. I spent most of my life like a salmon swimming upstream. I'm always going the wrong way, you know. Like this uh, women-men deal. I wanted you to be a certain way, and you all had it wrong. And if you just listened to me, I didn't think I was God, but I was certain I was on the board of directors or something, you know. <laughs> kind of important anyway, you know. But I feel a genuine sense of importance now. And I suppose that you might say, that through AA, I've come past being a woman, come past being a black, come past being some of these other things that you don't really get any credit for. Um, if you're able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, it doesn't really matter anything unless you train for that, you know. So most of my life, I just sort of floated into things. And I've come past all these things to try to join the human race. And it's all right, you know. That's all of us in there together. I like to look at... Um, the world and extract lessons from it, you know, from the material and extract lessons from it on a spiritual plane. And I see that everything on the planet links up with everything else. And that's how we're supposed to be. You know, we should all touch symbiotically through this thing that's called love. That's why when we have our meetings and we're at the table, the feeling is so strong because we are linked. It's the one time that that happens. And that doesn't always go on everywhere else. But, uh, Hopefully, if we do it individually, it'll finally link up. At least I try to do my part that way. God has given me things that I need to find out about this being a woman deal. One of it was a little girl. She's eight, beautiful, clever, of course, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I remember when she was uh, growing inside me, and I was thinking about how was I going to handle this mother deal. I never wanted to be anybody's mother. But I got about 34 years old, and I said, well, maybe I better do this, because time is running out, you know. <laughs> it's part of the things that people do is get to be somebody's mother. You know? <laughs> Don't say that I ever got left out. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't figure how would I comb her hair. You know, I see people who do all this intricate kind of little combing and braiding and fixing and scouring. So what do I know from these things? That takes a lot of time. God gave me a baby that had beautiful hair that didn't need combing for two years. <laughs> Until I got ready to learn how, you know. <clears throat> I've learned a tremendous number of things from my baby and from you. Looking at her with God running the whole deal. See, I found out I don't run anything. And it's very comfortable not to have to manage everything, you know. I can kind of sit down and take a rest. I learned what love was from looking at her. She loves me unconditionally. She just loves me. Not because I bought a new dress. Or not because I took her to a dance lesson. She just loves me. And uh, I say that God gives me these things to look at and extract these lessons from. Uh, I learned a lot about honesty from her. Because we have a deal. We talk. And mom can be wrong. I don't have to have all the right answers. All I have to do is be honest and be there. And we can find the answers together. So uh, it took a long time for me to see. See, I see things so good that I skip right over the whole thing. <laughs> A uh, person told me I couldn't see the forest with the trees or something like that. It makes simple matters complicated. But it took me a long time to see that that was Janet being a woman and enjoying it. Something that I haven't, hadn't ever really done before, you know. Um, a woman in AA does have special problems. That's a reality. I've learned not to distort reality, to twist reality, try to run away from it and make it ideal. 
See, for a long time I misunderstood that word. I thought that ideal meant the best. You want to go for the best situation. You want to be the best person. But when you're denying reality, then that's insanity. You know, you're never really there for any occasion. So, um, I'm grateful for having come to AA. I don't think AA is the be-all and the end-all. Uh, sometimes when I hear people say, AA is my life, I think that's great for them. AA for me was a chink in the wall that I was able to come through. Other people may find other ways. And it doesn't matter because God is limitless. He can do this thing any kind of way he wants to do, you know. Sometimes we sound so distant and arrogant because we're at AA, you know. And uh, I say it's a matter of joining the human race. So women in AA might have special problems, but I'm convinced that for myself, all the problems that I ever really have all initiate and end with me. And the best that I can do with you other people is to have you as objects of my love, mirrors of my experience, and images of myself. Other than that, there's no value. No. When I hear people now say, don't compare, I thought I heard that pretty good. When I first came to AA, I thought I heard the whole shot. This is a wonderful program for y'all, you know. <laughs> I understand everything here. Yeah. I did understand it, but in a jumbled way, because that's the kind of confused person I was. But um, I started to see don't compare in a different way. Don't compare, not so much because your drinking may not mirror that person's drinking, but because it's an incredible, stupid waste of your time, you know. <laughs> and, and this is your movie, you know. This is your energy that you devote to other people's looking and comparing, you know. Um, like I say, the beauty of this program to me is that it's a constant unfolding when they say keep coming. That's why, because it gets better. I don't like it gets better. It is better. You know? And I heard a guy say, the best is yet to come. And for me, it's peeling away a lot of those layers of what I thought was Janet and discovering the real me, totally without fear. Uh, that doesn't mean I've had a thousand every day, you know. Some days I don't want to do it. I see exactly how it should go. God gives me the news. All my mirrors show it to me, and I still don't want to do it. That's the perversity in me. But I can't stay in those states very long anymore. You know, if I'm uncomfortable with any situation, I know what to do. Jump on it. Change it. With God's help. I used to hear people, old timers as they say, whatever that means, since there's no longevity in this program, you know, say the ice gets thinner. I didn't like that either. The ice gets thinner. What kind of deal is this? They hoodwink you in here and then tell you it gets worse and it gets harder and you can never win. That's how I heard it. But now I know that the ice gets thinner for me means that I am no longer able to accept the same level of chicanery for myself that I always had. Some things that I thought were okay that I could sweep under the rug, I can't sweep them under there anymore. I have to deal with them and have to live with them. And not in a sad, negative kind of way. Because the aspect of God that I'm in touch with is totally positive, complete love. God doesn't make traps or set ditches. Or fix you because you didn't do it that time. Gotcha, you know. Yeah, I, there may be an aspect of God like that. Because like I say, God is limitless. But it is not useful to me at this time. So uh, women in AA, men in AA, fine. But how about people on the planet? People in love under God. For me, that's where it's going. And I just plot away at that and keep coming. I've joined the human race. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.